replace them with another superstar, uh, you're considered exceptional. And we're extremely fortunate to have uh, another exceptional superstar uh, to step into the game. We have with us today Ms. Sheila Musi. Uh, Sheila, if you'll, so you can put a face with a name, you know that she's been in our uh, tax office, uh, special tax director for us. Uh, she comes to us with uh, a good deal of experience, 30 and a half years of experience working as a, uh, in, in the school system as a, as a early childhood uh, uh, manager, uh, two office manager stints uh, in different schools, and uh, of course now our, our tax collector. So she brings a lot of school experience with her, and uh, I think you'll find her to to step in and Tracy is going to continue to work with Sheila to, to make this transition so you won't notice uh, any changes uh, at all. Her office is located uh, as you come in, uh, on the left, on the way out. Uh, her number is, uh, you can reach that just, uh, through the uh, central office number. Feel free to call Tracy on anything and we'll patch anything up that we need to along the way until we make and complete this transition. So I say thank you to Tracy. I say welcome aboard Sheila. And uh, we look forward to continuing uh, good work here for you, uh, Board of Education members. Next item we have on our agenda today is we have uh, an attendance award. Uh, each year, uh, the state encourages school districts to participate in a high attendance day. Now, obviously, we try to make every day a high attendance day, but we put a special emphasis on, on this day. Uh, the, the, the schools that participate, they're competing with other schools in multiple categories based on sizes and things like that. And so we're very fortunate today to have a winner. So uh, Mr. Hood, who serves uh, multiple roles in the district, but one of those is the Director of Pupil Personnel, uh, is going to uh, present an award here to one of our schools for, for winning. All right, Mr. Hood. I'll, I'll go ahead and let Mr. Boggs come up. He's going to be uh, representing the, the we, we've won a high attendance award uh, twice, uh, both of which were at the high school. About three years ago, the high school also won the high attendance award. So this was on, this time was on September the 20th. Um, there's two different categories, small school, large school, based on size. Uh, and um, so we, this time we're, we're on the small side. The last time we were actually on the large side. There was a few difference in numbers, but they broke this out at 750 or more and 749 or less. Um, I will tell you that on this, on this day, um, there were 621 students at, at, that could have been at school that day, and there were 601 of those were present. So we only had, they had uh, 20 kids uh, at some point during the day who were not there for a given part of the day. So um, the actual number, 96.12%. So we are going to, uh, this is a certificate of recognition. Uh, this certifies the award to Barstown High School in recognition of High Attendance Day regional winner. So we were, we were this is not a state winner, this is the regional winner. Uh, and there's many schools that are, are, are in our region. 96.12% uh, presented to Barstown High School, and we're going to present this to Mr. Boggs. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're, you're on post for the camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so, uh, hold on one second. Okay. A, a normal day's attendance in the district or in average of the state would be? Yeah, 94 and a half. Okay. Uh, right about the high schools generally around 94, so uh, they made some good strides that day. It also hit during a time we had some sickness going on, so uh, kudos to them for uh, making this a more important, I guess, than they normally do because they were 96.12 percent, but everything worked out great. So our region has a lot of schools, um, and that's a really good number. The the high attendance for the for the state on that day was 98.12%, and that was in Robertson County. I don't know how many students they, they may have had that day. Uh, it would not be anywhere near 700 or six, yeah, 750, though, so um, good job, high school. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Thank you. Good work. Appreciate it. Uh, the last item I have is just a reminder of some activities in your uh, uh, board packet there. Uh, I think we've talked about the uh, regional KSBA meeting on October 24th. We will uh, uh, meet here and 
and, and go from there. So uh, also uh, uh, make note of the Veterans Day program uh, on uh, November the 10th, uh, if you will. There are several music programs uh, going on, uh, activities uh, uh, coming up, and also uh, holiday programs. So take a look at that and uh, enjoy the ones that you can attend. And that concludes the Superintendent's report today. The next item is recognition of visitors. If there's anyone that would like to address the board, please stand at the podium with your name and address. Being none, we'll right along. Okay. Item six, discussion of assessment results. Let me uh, do a, a brief introduction here. The, uh, the release of our 1617 student assessment scores, uh, they look different than they have in the previous years. Um, as you know, we're no longer using the No Child Left Behind model. Uh, we're now instead we're using the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, which uh, was passed in 2015 as part of Senate Bill 1 uh, in 2017. And so this would be considered a, a transition year uh, for uh, our assessment scores. Um, we set the bar pretty high last year. I'll just put it that way. We were a distinguished school district. Uh, we were very, very pleased uh, with that. And I can say without a doubt, uh, once again, the Barstown City School System uh, will be celebrating their assessment scores again. Even though they're not using the measurement system that we're accustomed to, uh, the numbers are extremely uh, impressive. Uh, I'm going to let Tim and uh, Michelle, uh, uh, our CIA directors, uh, uh, share more uh, information about uh, how we were successful, but uh, board members, uh, I want you to you know and I want you to be proud of, of your administrators, uh, your, your teachers, uh, teaching staff, uh, students and parents. Uh, we have uh, knocked it out of the park again. So at this time we'll have Mr. Beck and uh, Ms. Balding uh, present our 2017 test scores. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Holstall said, we uh, no longer have a single indicator as we have in the past with a single indicator and a single label, but we just we still have many of the components that we had under the previous label. So when we look at those, there are essentially five components with around 20 indicators. So we took those five components and indicators from previous years and compared them to this year to better to be able to give you an apples to apples comparison because that's how we grow. So when we do that, of the 20 indicators that we looked at, we have grown in 17 of those 20s from the previous year. Well, members, you'll find out on 119, I think, in your packet there. That page is referring to. Sorry, we have a hard copy, too. And as the third bullet shows you, of those 20 indicators, 14 are the highest we've ever achieved on the state assessments. And of those 20, 12 are now above state scores. So we're really excited about where we are with those different indicators and components. And what we'd like to do now is we'd like to break each component down and take a look at each one individually and give you some information on that. So we're gonna start with component number one, which is achievement. And our achievement scores are based on the student's performance on the test, whether it be a novice, apprentice, proficient, or distinguished. So uh, we have nine content indicators um, that we looked at for our scores this year. Um, and that's in your chart there on that first page. The first is our uh, elementary reading score. Um, you will see that that is the highest score that the elementary has received in reading at a 53.3. Our elementary math um, went down a little bit. We saw a decrease in that. Um, it, it is important to note that there was a decrease in the math scores statewide at the elementary school level. So um, all the districts across the state are looking at uh, you know, their math instruction, instructional pr um, strategies and practices, looking at common assessments that we are using. Um, and it's also important to note that the state right now is looking at um, a revision of those math standards. So we'll be taking all of that into consideration as we make plans to improve those math scores. Elementary social studies um, was the highest that we've had at 57.6 and our elementary writing uh, was our highest score so far and also outscored um, the state score for this year. Middle school reading 
um, was an increase and the highest that we've had and it too was above the state score and our middle school math much like our elementary school we had a decrease there middle uh, school social studies was um, higher than the previous year we're still working towards that state score our middle school writing we took a decrease and that one too was a decrease um, we saw statewide and then high school writing had a significant increase there um, and was well above the state score the next component that we're going to take a look at is college and career readiness and just as a brief review, those are the students that have met benchmark on ACT or considered college ready. And the students that get either through ASVAB or industry certification or ACT work keys are considered career ready. Uh, one of the things I'd also like to pause and, and let you know is in your packet, your form looks a little bit different than the one you're looking at now because as we put this data together, we were very excited about how we did. We thought it would give you some perspective to go ahead and add the previous years when KPREP initially rolled out. So you could see how we were doing over time instead of just the previous year. So with CC CCR, you can see that we have now achieved the highest CCR rating that we've ever had. And we are now above the state rating too. The next component is the end of course, or as you'll hear them, we love our acronyms. Uh, we call them EOCs, end of course. EOC courses are based on ACT Quality Core. Of note is that that is changing. Those will be in the future based upon the Kentucky Core content. So we will no longer be able to compare previous year's EOCs to the next year's. This will be our last year doing that. They're working on English 2 as we speak. Um, for last year, we had a, a tiny little dip in English 2, but we're still above the state average. Algebra 2, unfortunately following our math trend, we saw a decrease there too, just like other districts across the state have seen, and that was universal across the state. Um, in biology, we have our highest ever score and above the state, and in U.S. history, we had a significant increase, um, and our highest ever score and above the state. Next is component four, and that is our graduation rate. The state of Kentucky and the federal government use what's called a four-year cohort rate. It's our students that come into us as a freshman and graduate with a, a regular degree in four years. And you can see that we've now achieved 95.1, which is our highest ever, and we're significantly above the state in that average. And our last component is ACT, and this is probably uh, one of the greatest shining stars that we have, and you can see in ACT, there are four components, and then we get a composite score each year. And in those four components, we have now achieved the highest we've ever achieved, and we're significantly above the state in almost every area, even our composite, which is a 20.4. And one of the things that I would like to remind you, as somebody that deals with data a lot, some numbers uh, don't represent the true score, in ACT, when you look at the difference between a 20.4 and a 20.3, that's significant. It may not seem like much, like a six point gain or a 10 point gain, but even a tenth of a point is extremely significant on this because it's a nationwide norm reference test. And then lastly, I'd like to leave you with, as Mr. Holzclaw said, we no longer can take all of these components and put them together. In our previous year, any school district that had a, a holistic score all put together of all these components of a 70.5 was considered a distinguished district. Well, we made that, and we were able to celebrate that fact that we were a distinguished district. There's actually another component that's a little bit higher than that, and that is a 71.9, and at that cutoff, you're in the 95th percentile of all districts. Last year, only 16 districts across the state achieved that. Well, when we put together our components this year and we do our internal calculations, we are slightly above the 71.9. So while we're not gonna get that distinction from the state level, when we do our own math and put it together, we would have seen a district of distinction this year. I feel very confident in letting you know that. So we're very excited about where we are are there any questions? Yes, sir. Is there any correlation with the changeover to the Singapore model? Uh, is that an across the state event that might have uh, somehow been a negative trend in the math? Um, 
I don't know if it was across the state as much, uh, but any kind of changeover can always, even if it's a positive changeover, can sometimes have that initial, um, they call it an implementation decrease, where that was first that a couple year, year ago we did that, or this year? Or? Uh, I think it was four years ago, wasn't it? It's been a while, I know. But it was four years ago. I just wondered if that had somehow transcended into you know, a negative effect or somehow. Um, I, my first initial reaction would probably be no, uh, because we just saw this dip this year. And last year we saw a pretty substantial increase okay. in the work, especially at the elementary level, substantial increase. So more than likely it's probably not in that area. Congratulations. Oh, we didn't teach a single class. It was the <laughs> teachers. <laughs> it was you're the bearer of good uh, well, Yeah, we, we do get to do that. Can you tell me a little bit about the focus groups going into looking at the gap? Yes, yes, I can. Um, previously, the focus groups included what would be considered a non-duplicate gap, meaning if you fell into any of the categories of gap, which are all of the minority groups, uh, not white and not Asian, but all of the minority groups that traditionally underperform on standardized tests, you were considered GAP. Uh, free and reduced lunch, if, if you're free or reduced, you're GAP. And then special education, you're GAP. They have sensed or will this coming year add another category to that, which is the English language learners, our, our ESL kids. Those are gonna be GAP. And those kids have never been a part of state testing separately. They've always, they've taken the K-PREP and they're part of the whole group, but we've never pulled them out and just measured this alone. So that'll be a little different too. And then the last piece that's going to be different under the new accountability model is these students were always compared to themselves or compared to the test itself. We never compared those students with non-GAP students. And for the first time ever, that's going to be a part of it to where we're going to see how African American students students did compared to Hispanic students, compared to white <coughs> students. We're going to see how special ed did compared to, that will be a part of our new accountability. And the term that you're going to hear to describe that is going to be one you're probably aware of, it's achievement gap. They're going to be monitoring the achievement gap between all of those groups. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. That may Anyone else have a question? Very good. Thank you all so much. Appreciate the great news. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, item, item, item seven, approval of revised VG1 bus garage relocation building upgrade project. Okay, for um, uh, for this item, uh, what we what we have here is is you guys approved the VG one uh, some time ago, as, as you're aware. The project is is now for the most part complete. So we have a revised VG one in front of you today that that basically takes takes everything into consideration. Um, any of the change orders which you're going to be uh, looking at on the next item, those change order numbers will be in, in, incorporated in there as well. Um, along with uh, some updates in the contingency fund. So, so basically all we're doing uh, for this is, is taking the BG1 that we had, this is the revision uh, that KDE wants to see, uh, to see all of the numbers, it gives the total funds, uh, where the funding source came from and everything for this project. Uh, and, and I would assume uh, after this we, we're really close to the closeout of the BG1 for the bus garage. So um, we'll talk about this a little more in, in section eight, but just the uh, approval of the revised BG1 is what we're asking for uh, at this time. It's going to be a little while. Mm -hmm. yeah, no so all the punch, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to ask, are all the punch lists complete? I mean, the, the punch list has been uh, com uh, completed by the by our architect. There are still a couple of items that that we're looking at for the uh, the contractor to come back and complete. Uh, there's there's one item on there that the um, uh, Mr. Spalding with uh, code enforcement has asked us to do <coughs> an upgrade, um, a mandatory upgrade from when this building was done. It has to do with fire the fire alarm system um, in an area that no one knew would need it at garage at the garage door. 
because um, they're open most of the time, probably all of the time during the day. So we're taking a look at those. Uh, we don't see that being a, um, a big expense, um, I don't think. We'll see, how that, we'll see how that goes. But yes, for the most part, it is, um, everything is, is finished. Uh, other than just a couple of other small items and again we'll be coming back to you with a with a BG5 later on which will be a final close out for this so just to sum up what we're doing we're looking at a revised BG1 uh, with some changes uh, that we need to you have approved this but we're going to be uh, approving the revised BG1 which will be connected to the next item on the agenda okay this is inclusive of the beam uh, change uh, overall yes yes okay any more questions make a motion to approve the revised bg1 second second all those in favor signify by saying aye aye uh -huh. opposed there are none item eight we will change order one and two bus garage relocation building upgrades reports once Project. again once again, this is a, uh, the change orders that we have we have done. Uh, you have approved those. There were some there were some numbers that we had to get updated um, as we were working through this project. Um, again, we we have taken a look at or, or I have taken a look at, at all of these. They are in order. Some of which, of course, um, number one change order that you approved was the beam that uh, Mr. Stone you just talked about. That's pretty uh, self-explanatory. And then in change order two, it, it shows change order two, there was actually seven items on change order two, some of which were a, were a cost to us that, that, had, to be, that had to be done, uh, was found through coding, through different things throughout the project. Um, there was at least one um, uh, item number three um, that was a credit to us for almost $8,000 and some and something that we we actually found that we did not need which doesn't happen too often so we were we were very grateful for that um, item number two was was basically we found that the sewer uh, there was there was actually a, a hookup for the sewer in the back that that um, I won't say that previous owners didn't know about they knew about it but we were able to hook into this and save us lots of time and money down the road. Um, I mean, the main sewer that goes all the way down Sunset Drive and over to the industrial park in Withrow Court. So it's, it was a big deal. That was a $10,000 item, but it was, I can tell you that it was well worth it uh, for us for now and, and the future. So um, I can answer any questions you have, but you, you, you basically approved these before, but because of the changes and the fact that we have a somewhat of a new, a new system that's taking place simultaneously, which I'll show you in another item, I'll just ask for your approval again for change order one and two with all the numbers intact uh, that would be on the revised BG1 that you just approved. Questions? I have a motion to approve change orders one and two. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed are none. Motion passed. Item nine, approval. Uh, fiscal year 18, uh, 2018 capital funds request. All right, if you'll note on, uh, I think it's on page 137 of your packet there, you'll pull up a Kentucky Department of Education capital funds request form. We'll work our way through this uh, um, and um, hopefully we get to the end of it. Uh, it'll make a little bit of sense to us on what we're actually doing. Uh, this does come back to, uh, in the end, we're gonna be looking at a number uh, concerning the beam uh, in the uh, warehouse area. Um, so we start with what we're, what we're trying to do, we're gonna get a, uh, I, I guess to begin with, uh, the formula that we'll be using is that capital outlay plus unused bonding funds equal capital funds. So we need to get to the capital funds and that's what I'm going to walk you through. Up on line two uh, and line three, uh, there's a total of uh, $220,923. Uh, this is the uh, capital outlay money uh, that we uh, receive each year through the SEEK. And it's based on uh, average daily attendance 
uh, the number of students that we have we get so much money keep in mind that typically uh, this money uh, it can be used for things like replacement of air conditioning repairs on roof unforeseen uh, in past years with uh, the recent years with uh, uh, the financial situation being difficult we've been able to roll this money into general fund and you get that almost automatic now we're going back to a little more of a uh, things are leveling out some and so now we're going to do this just a little bit different but that's where that money comes from the 220,000 uh, comes from there then if you look at um, on line uh, number four uh, you'll see uh, the building fund that's uh, fund 320 and now this is the money that uh, we talked about back in in June we had Joan uh, Joan Nance come and talk to us about the bonding projects this is the money that we that we generate through our nickel accounts and it's going to uh, you'll see an amount there of two million three hundred sixty one thousand five hundred sixty one dollars all right so we take those two we take those two numbers um, we're going to um, go down on line 14 um, we're going to look at uh, uh, the amount of money that we have committed to making our debt service in other words what do we owe on these bonding projects when you look at that number you'll see on line uh, 15 there you'll see two million uh, two hundred twenty six thousand six hundred and ninety dollars so when we do our math here we go back up and we add line three plus line four and you won't see this number on your form but we'll see two million five hundred and eighty two thousand four hundred and seventy nine dollars then you take the debt service uh, that we just talked about there on line number 15 subtract that from the number I just gave you and you'll have five hundred and fifty five thousand seven hundred and eighty nine dollars then when you deduct the beam out uh, that we're trying to pay for out of this money that's what you're doing you're going to be approving this number here in just a few moments uh, we subtract it out we get four hundred and twenty five thousand eight hundred and ninety nine dollars and that's what you'll see on line 17 so that's the remaining balance of the capital funds remember what makes capital funds remember it's capital outlay plus unused bonding funds so we have four hundred and twenty five thousand eight hundred eighty nine dollars left in that account and we're taking one hundred twenty nine dollars out of it one hundred twenty nine thousand out of nine hundred for the beam and what you're approving today uh, is permission to use that one hundred and twenty nine thousand nine hundred dollars uh, out of the total of five hundred fifty five thousand seven hundred and eighty nine that's a long way to get there <laughs> but we're there could you repeat that can i repeat that <laughs> <laughs> any questions comments okay do i hear approval for uh fiscal year 2018 capital funds request for 129 to use to pay the beam second second all those in favor signify by saying aye, aye. opposed there are none item number number 10 approval bg1 softball field project now we've been talking about this uh, uh, uh since uh, uh well back in the summer we began our conversation last meeting you gave us approval to uh, move forward with the uh, demolition of the of the uh, old softball uh, facility uh, which we have uh, basically completed that uh, at no cost uh, to the district uh, and so we are prepared we have a blank slate uh, architects are working uh, to put together uh, construction documents which we're going to see here uh, in just a minute on item 12 and then uh, on item 11 we're going to be looking at a bg1 uh, todd is going to share with you a little bit more about this but you just you just saw bg1 just a few moments ago and then you're going to see a completely different form of a bg1 uh, that todd's going to share with you in just a, in just a second and what, what we're telling you is is starting in october the first a new system has been put in place and we refer to this as the fact pack yeah and uh, um, another great acronym <laughs> yeah the, the, the. but but this will be a little bit different process and todd's going to walk us through uh these two items uh first of all we're going to be looking at the bg1 so yes yeah, so the so the the fact pack as it's known um what what is happening there is is before all bg1s basically the architect was the uh, the one who would put this in for you, either either him or uh, or Joe Nance, um, one of those two people would initiate the BG1 with our approval. They would send it to the state. Well, now um, I'm not sure what 
why uh, or how, but they're asking for us to do this. So this application that you've got before you was the was the uh, the BG1 initial uh, form that we sent up uh, to get their approval. So I want to go through that with you just a second. I want to highlight a, a couple of things here uh, in this in this document. Um, one of which there are on the description and scope part. Uh, this of course is a replacement. Um, and it must be replaced now because <laughs> the other one is gone. So there is a replacement there. It is also considered a minor project um, based on the number that, that the total cost is going to be. So there's a minor project there. Um, over, on, uh, over on page two, if you'll look down, there is a financial plan of probable cost. And what we have, uh, what you'll see there is we've got a uh, basically a total construction cost uh, of two hundred and fifty thousand um, we have a uh, construction conting contingency uh, which is twelve thousand five hundred and an architect engineer fee of twenty six thousand five hundred uh, just so you know we just did a revised BG1 these numbers will change based on the total construction cost we do not believe uh, that we will have a construction cost of $250,000. We think uh, because of being able to do some of the work ourselves, be, being able to uh, have a market that is really good right now for bidding, uh, we do not see that as being a, a number that we will definitely go over. We do see that being a number that is high and we will uh, be able to come in much lower than that. Um, over on the next page, page three is other probable costs. So, so if you add those three columns up, you'll get a total cost of $291,000. Now, um, on down on the funds available, um, uh, what Mr. Hostall was just talking about was at first, um, we had this basically listed under the capital funds. Uh, they have asked us to go back and do this as a general fund project. And then at, at this point, that he just explained, we will go back and pull this from that uh, from that general fund category, uh, and be able to use these capital funds how we see fit uh, uh, for for us on this particular project. Does that make sense to you, board members? Think that process we just went through on the 129, we'll pull this number out of that the same way. Uh, temporarily, we have to show it on the general fund. We'll come back and get it out of capital funds. So that balance of 400 and some odd. Uh, thousand is where this balance will be subtracted from. Yes, that's correct. At the end of the day, at once they get past the initial mm -hmm. general fund. Yep. You have to you have to request permission. It's which one comes first, and they put us in an awkward position. You you can't do the transfer before you do the BG one. So. Right. Okay. So um, I, I'll go over the, the, this and the next one in the um, item number. Uh, after we approve this part. So if we can, if we can get an approval for the uh, BG1 for the softball field project, uh, then we'll move on, we'll move on from there. To, to be full disclosure with you, what will happen is, uh, you'll, assuming that you approve the BG1 today, and then th this is uh, already uh, in uh, the department's hands. And so it's a matter of procedure, it's a matter of timing for them to get to it. it uh, things are complete. Uh, all of the uh, uh, requests that they've made to us uh, to adjust, adapt, a few things. We made all those things. It's sitting there. The status now is processing, mean, meaning basically that they need to have time to get to it. It's so once we pull the trigger on this, what's the calendar days necessary to complete the project before the weather breaks? Well, that, that's, uh, I guess, <laughs> I don't know the real answer to that. We do, but well, we have... We have done, taken some steps, uh, I think, to ensure, for instance, we will, we're doing, going with an approval from the city. If, if for some reason we are not ready to, to play in, in April uh, to be able to use the Don Haunted Field, we have an agreement already set in place with them. And the people in our, our people already know that. Right. They knew that way up front. But, but completion itself, that'll be, we'll have to get help from those construction people uh, that are going to bid on it, and uh, uh, we will get we will give some guidance on how soon we want that done. Uh, be honest with you, we will not play games on the field 
uh, this uh, in 2018. It won't happen. Grass doesn't grow in January, February at all. Uh, That's what I was getting at. So, yeah. So, so there, there, we definitely have another field uh, through the city. We have a letter uh, granting us permission to use that field. Uh, we're going to convert a baseball field to a softball field, and then when we leave, we're going to put it back to a, to a baseball field. The timing, Mr. Hood's just been wonderful working with uh, Mr. Jeffries on this, and I've worked with Mayor on, on that end of it, but they're doing a renovation of that field, so our timing is absolutely perfect. Uh, so the stuff, the things that we do will certainly just help them along the way as they reconstruct to a baseball. Anything to add to that, Mr. Hood? I think that's, we consider artificial turf for the softball field. You know, um, to be honest, most people don't want to, most softball players don't want to play on turf. Um, we, the only real place we checked, and I went to Boyle County and took some nice videos, and I was all excited about it, and I was the only one real excited when I came back and, and showed them. Uh, I don't know if it's a trajectory issue. I, I don't know. They just, and around here we have, there is none. The closest one that I know of is Boyle County, and the only reason they really have it is because their football field is turf, and they in, incorporated those two in together. Same way with Lexington Catholic. So anyone who has a turf softball field only has turf softball because they are incorporated into their baseball or football complex. No one that I know of just has a softball field that's turf. So, but I don't, I don't know, um, I, I don't know why, because as a coach myself, it seems like if I didn't have to line my field and worry about rain out, all of those things would be great, but that's just not what that's just not what the what you see right now. Hmm. Yeah, about the same thing. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, the cost would have been yeah, right. We'll discuss this after the meeting. Okay. <laughs> I might have some input. Okay. Okay. So um <laughs> I was, I still, I was still waiting on an approval. Okay, I need a, a motion to approve uh, so PG1 <laughs> softball field project. Second. And a second. second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed or none. Item number 11. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Okay. Okay. Item number 11, approval construction document softball field project. So last time we were here, uh, uh, I was able to show you a picture of this. They have done, they have done a little bit of adjusting uh, to this particular picture. This is, this will probably be more easy for you to understand and to get an idea on what we're doing than than the actual form that I show that I've sent you. This this document, um, this document basically is talking about roof plans. Um, it's talking about spacing of, of trusses. It's talking about um, uh, where where all the footers are going to be, things of that nature that that I have to really look at and, and make sure is correct. I can tell you that our plan is to uh, mirror the baseball field as as close as we can. Uh, so you know the brick, the colors, everything, so they all look similar to what we have down there. Um, we we also in this plan have uh, a place for storage like they do and a possible addition of a locker room which the baseball has so you know this addresses title nine issues it addresses the fact that our field needs to be updated lots of great things going on with this particular plan um, a couple of things that they change one uh, on our request uh, we, we thought maybe we would have wings here for these uh, for for the um, for the bleachers, but we are able to with a with one larger set right here. We're able to eliminate two side wings, which is uh, which gives fans the ability to sit and or stand in this area right here, which they do uh, for baseball, and a lot of people like that. Um, this also gives us a lot of uh, right here in this front row of seating. It gives us. Um, I think it was four or five different areas for ADA accessibility to where they can sit right here inside and see over this wall, uh, prime, so they would have prime seats for that. Um, the concession stand is going to be, uh, right now, we're going to be opening up the back of this current building. If, when you leave today, if you'll look, there's only one structure that's really left out there on this, on this particular side. 
And so our plan is to put the concession stand in the back, which will allow people from both sides to come around, get that. That is currently over on the side. It doesn't work real well. This gives them the ability. Plus there's a set of stairs in here that leads up to the top of the press box that we're going to eliminate get those out of the way, you'll actually go through up the steps here and into the press box at the top, much like our uh, baseball field does now. Um, as you know, we're moving the field basically 20, 20 to 22 feet from this, this direction. You may have seen some flags out there. You may have seen some different things that we have set up that, that kind of shows that. That's going to get us our dimension right here, which is 185 feet. You can see it goes right to the edge of the parking lot. There is a little bit of movement, possibly this direction, not a lot, which anything we do here, I'm kind of using this, will help us in that area. But we do have the 185. We are uh, going to be proposing an eight foot fence instead of a six to allow us to, uh, on height restrictions. Um, all of this that you see here will be poured concrete. Everything that you see on this dotted line will be a fence, fenced-in area that goes all the way around, of course. Uh, mesh will be from the end of the dugout around the, the um, it'll kind of, kind of come in and around that. Uh, then, of course, there'll be no mesh here for people to, for people to see. Um, gives us the ability, this is a gate entrance right here. Um, and we will probably look at a, a, you know, a gate similar to what we have going into the high, to the football field a little bit with our, you know, our arch there. Uh, gives them the ability to uh, charge admission uh, that is somewhat limited right now, hard to just rope off for them. So, uh, yes. Does the, the fence that's parallel to the road, the exterior fence, is that an eight foot fence? Right here. Yeah. This one is, uh, I believe this is six. Does it have, pri does it have privacy slabs? This, no, uh, this, this particular fence right here uh, would be similar to the one that we just currently took down. You have a mesh um, on it though instead of slats? Yeah, I, do, I don't know the... Well, uh, my, problem and, with it is, my problem with it is, why are you going to pay when you get it for free if you're standing there on the sidewalk if you, where you took the wings off of the bleachers? I wouldn't have mesh on it, And it could. It very well could. Uh, when we had that discussion, they asked where for sure I wanted, where we for sure wanted mesh, which I told them from the edge of the dugout, uh, which would be all the way to basically here. So I think what you're asking, and I, I, I see your point. So what we, what we want is we also want mesh here because if not they could just stand out here and watch everything so well, I mean I, there's a difference between uh, me are we on the same page of mesh versus a privacy slab the little mm -hmm. things that go into the end of the channels and, and I would say that what we have done here is, is the mesh and what we have always done in the other areas is a mesh is a mesh fence um, uh, a, a mesh fabric, you know, I we guess. Ought to, we ought to price that. We will. You can see that that's a, okay. that flat idea is a good idea. Okay. Yeah, well, well, because we'll definitely do with that. With the wings gone there, I mean, you're only, what, 30 feet from the home plate mm -hmm. there, and there's really no. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. if, if your goal is to charge an, admit, an admission, then you're mm -hmm. not going to have much luck there when it's. Yes, I agree. So, yes, we will, we will address that with them on what type of material we need from there, basically to here, in those two areas. Yeah. The other thing we had to do uh, right here in order to give, right now there's only about uh, four, three to four feet from this, well you can't see it on here because they've moved it, but there was about three to four feet right here to get through. So we'll actually have to uh, cut this sidewalk just a little bit. That's a, that's a six foot sidewalk. I think it will go down to a four, which still gives you plenty of room to, to walk through there, but it opens up this area for people to come around to the concession stand or if they walk around this way to get to this dugout. Um, just gives them extra. Now, uh, as you can see, the, the best thing is I'm, um, we're not moving the existing transformer. We think that that's gonna be, we've got plenty of distance there. None of that has to move. And believe it or not, if my projections are correct, the scoreboard uh, will be able to stay by about two feet. So that's not a deal breaker. Uh, it is a lot of work to move the scoreboard, uh, but if, if we have to, of course we will. If not, it will just save us a little bit of 
of manpower and, and money for some poles, new poles. So, any questions? Oh, uh, like I said, this this form's a little bit hard to see. So uh, I can just tell you that that we have to we have to by be inspected. So it'll, there'll be permits. We have to have a we have to have a uh, form. All of our forms have to be inspected before concrete's poured. There'll be a framing inspection done and then a final inspection done, much like you would on your home. So nothing will be done that that can't that has to be specked out by by Mr. Spalding and, and his his crew at, at the code enforcement. So any any questions over? If not, if uh, if we could approve the construction documents, then we will be ready to move forward. I hear a motion to approve the construction doc documents for the salt hole field project. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed are no. Thank you all. Thank you. Item right, number 12, second reading of board policy updates. And these are going to be the easy ones to understand today. All right. Uh, what we found during the, the request for a proposal for our new health clinic is that we worked real hard on the contract and on the language going into the uh, proposal. And there were five uh, board policies that needed a little bit of tweaking to make sure that the um, health clinic fit into that properly. Um, and the, as a reminder, 5.3 and 5.31 were just exceptions that allowed the uh, health clinic uh, to be ex exempt from those two policies. Uh, 9.21 was the health requirement services policy and in that policy uh, the health clinic was going to be in addition to all the services that we already do. We wanted to make sure that was clear. And then the 9.221 was the supervision of students and that says just uh, identified students if they came from any of our other two campuses onto to, to the health clinic. And then the last one was 9.2241, which allowed the health clinic to dispense medication uh, in our policies. And uh, I think they're all in good order. And with your approval, we will get those placed into our uh, new policies. I think it's our turn to Yes, sir. That that he did. Uh, we, we, we got them approved by our attorney before I brought them to you the first time. And so they are they are good to go. Tell me it's questions. Make a motion to approve second reading. Second. 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 All in favor say by saying aye. 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 Opposed are no. Thank you. Item thirteen, KEA local civics testing. We're not gonna have to take this today. Well it's possible. <laughs> uh, you need to pay attention to Mr. Beck said he could very well give this to all of us. So. But in two thousand seventeen the uh, General Assembly passed a, what we know was Senate Bill one fifty nine. Uh, in short, what this says is that a student that graduates from high school must be able to pass a test that is created at the local level and approved by the local board. And so that's kind of where we're here today, and uh, Mr. Beck is going to provide us with uh, uh, some more details on that at this time. Thank you, sir. Um, as Mr. Holstall said, because of the new uh, Senate Bill 159, our current juniors will have to pass starting in 2018, a civics test of 100 questions. Those uh, questions must be developed from the material found on the United States Citizen and Immigration Test. Uh, so what we did a few months back is we began to get together all of our K through 12 civics teachers and we put them together and gave them that information and we began to develop our first section of the test. We went through about three different revisions before we felt like it was ready. Um, you have a PDF copy of that. Uh, some of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did were, number one, we wanted to make sure we created it in a format that was multiple choice so that we could grade that quickly and efficiently and get data back to the students. We also wanted to uh, put it together in a platform that we controlled. We decided on uh, using the Google platform. It'll be given to the students in a Google form set up as a quiz. Uh, the students are required to score at least a 60% or better uh, to be considered passing. And there are no limits on retake, so the students can also retake it. What we're doing is we're going to put together this material and also give it to the elementary and the middle schools too to begin uh, reviewing that material. However, the students are not eligible to actually take the test until ninth grade. 
So next year, uh, although the juniors must pass it, we're going to begin administering it to 9th through 11th. And we want to go ahead because once a student meets that requirement, whether it's in 9th grade, 10th grade, they've already met that requirement and they're good to go. Also, if they leave for some reason and go to another county, that, that carries on with them the same way their freshman algebra credit would also too. So what I have before you today is the final product that we've put together for that and we're ready to administer in the spring with your approval. I have two questions. One, yes, and I have the, there's an iPad app for that too on the immigration test. Have you discovered that or looked into yes, that? Yes, yes. Um, training the, or study or whatever. The actual the immigration naturalization test that they give, they ask open-ended questions. And that was one of the struggles that we had creating it. Uh, a good example of that would be a question that may say, if you were taking it, they would say, Mr. Stone, can you name a Native American group? Well, there's a list that the administrator would have of literally hundreds of those. Mm -hmm. That makes it difficult for us to score something like that because we'd have to hand score literally all right. of those. So um, we revised a lot of that material so it would say, for example, in that situation, our test says which of the following are not a Native American group. And, and we give three that are right. and then one that is not. So um, we will have access to the iPad app that we could use on that, but it would be the one that we've created in Google. Second question is, uh, is there any kind of uh, exemption for an ESL? Uh, no, there is not. The only caveat would be uh, special education students. Their IEP considerations still apply to this test also. So if they get a reader for a general purpose assessment, they would for this also. But our ESL students are required to uh, pass this also. Thank you. Which uh, additional information that I know you didn't ask, but uh, if it uh, clarifies a little more, we do an outstanding job in our ESL population that over 90% of our students are exited from the ESL program by the time they get to high school. So if we're looking at numbers in the 30 elementary and primary, by the time they get to high school, we still only have one to two students that are technically still in the ESL program. They've generally been exited uh, about fifth grade, the last of them in middle school usually. And usually if you get one in high school, we got them late. Thank you. Mr. Hmm? Sims, one follow up on your question. That app you're referring to, is it a study app? Yes. Would, do you see any benefit uh, along the way if a student did have a difficult time? Uh, that Absolutely. Could probably yeah, use because that it's app? the same material. So, yeah. I just had a friend that took the test and all that, and he, we quizzed each other right before I was helping him out on that app. So it's very. That's a good idea. It's very helpful. Yeah. You know, kind of led to my question is um, for a student who may not be in the structured classroom is there a list of study guides or whatever that they can go to for um, the material just through the immigration and naturalization test okay. that spoke of. that's the only one that we have available right. and that's where we had to draw all of our material from to create the test okay. this is then is not a uniform test um, th that's a good question uh, it, it is and it is not in the sense that we all had to pull from the same 100 questions that Mr. Stone was speaking of but the way that those questions are asked and the way that the students are tested is going to look different at each local school board depending upon how they decided to put together. Uh, I will say we've shared our material uh, with the CKEC uh, uh, cooperative and a lot of districts have taken what we've already created and have begun working for it. So I think what you're going to see is in Central Kentucky, a lot of them are going to look just like ours. There's, there's just not a lot of reason to change it much once good products been put together. Questions, more comments? Do I hear approval for the KDA local civics test as presented? So moved. So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Those there are none. Thank you. Thank you. Item 14, approval of 2017-18 notices of shortened school day. We have Mr. Boston going to share with us some details here on the next two items. Okay, we're coming in the fall break Disneyland trip. I think my timing was about off the back. Couldn't get out of my chair. Um, <laughs> so guys, we're coming to you today to go over um, our shortened school slash week notices that we have for the school year. Um, every year we have students in the district who have a modified attendance schedule. 
Um, that schedule is determined by their IEP team or admissions and release committee, and then we then notify the board of those for, for your approval. Um, if you look in your packet, there should be a total of, I believe there was eight shortened school day notices this school year. Four of those are students that um, were on the shortened school day last school year, and then four of those are new shortened school day or school week applications. Um, two of the new students came to us from other school districts already on a short a shortened day, so we're just continuing that. But we still meet annually to, to make that determination. Um, the other two students are two of our moderate and severe disability students who are receiving outside therapy somewhere either in our community or in another, in another town, maybe driving to Louisville, and they have appointments basically stacked back to back to where instead of their parent taking them multiple times to a location throughout the week, they've scheduled that in such a way where they take them maybe to one clinic for ex this appointment, this appointment, this appointment, et cetera. So that, that allows them to miss one school day but makes it a lot easier on their overall week and their stamina and ability to still um, come to school and participate on those other days. Um, we do have one student who um, had been on a shortened school day all of his school career that is now participating in a full school day. This past year was the first, the first year that he ever did a full school day in his whole educational career, and this being the, the second year, and he continues to make um, exceptional progress. If, if we'd have seen this student in preschool and kindergarten, I probably would have thought, I don't know if he's ever going to be able to. But through these therapies that he's had in school and out, and just the team that he, that's been surrounding this kiddo, he's doing, he's, he's doing um, phenomenal things. Um, we do get medical documentation and medical recommendations from each of these child children's physicians. Um, th this cannot be something that ARC can consider without um, a medical provider saying, hey, I think little Jimmy or little Susie or whomever um, needs this. So the ARC then takes those medical provider recommendations, makes the discussion, talks about what that will look like in the school week, and then writes that into their um, special education plan. Are there any questions over any of these? What would be a typical reason for a, a student request, or requesting a shortened uh, school day? That's, good, that's a good question. So we have um, a couple of our students in the district with severe autism who to even come to school at all is such a stress on their sensory system that they can typically only stay a few hours at a time before they just either shut down, you know, they need to go to sleep, they're physically and emotionally exhausted, or um, their behavior escalates in such a way where it's just not productive to, to, to them to be here to learn. It's, it's actually more detrimental than spending the remainder of the three hours a day at school. So a lot of times what parents recognizing this, but with us still having compulsory attendance laws that requires children to come to school, the parents seek the medical provider's um, justification or support in saying, hey, my daughter or my son, I don't think this is good for them. I've talked to the school about it. We get that. And the reason, the whole reason we do these shortened school days, shortened week notices, are that when a child is on a shortened day or a shortened week and the board has approved it, we can get full um, ADA funding for those children, even though they're not here the entire day. There's a special coding that happens in Infinite Campus that says, even though child A may be gone a half day, the school district can still get the full funding piece. I know that's a little bit more than what your, what your question asked, but that's, that's some of the um, examples. The other one was like, we have a, a couple young men at our elementary school who, whose parents and whose doctors have recommended outside therapies that may be provided in the school setting, but these outside therapies may target more um, medically related needs and not necessarily school related needs. So rather than have appointments at you know, five, six, seven, eight o'clock in the afternoon, having to get their kids from school around three, drive to Louisville or wherever to get these appointments, they'll stack them all in a certain day. So one little guy misses, I think, Wednesdays and one little guy misses Thursdays. And the, the ARCA said, yes, you know, the, the medical professionals recommended this. We agree that it's not a detriment to them at school to not be here for that day. So we're writing that into their plan where they can be excused that day rather than count it absent. Very good. So. Thank you. You're welcome. So if there's no que more questions, just ask for y'all's approval on these students. Uh, do I have approval for 2017-18 uh, notices of shortened school days? Someone. Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, there are none. Thank you. The next one's me as well, guys. Uh, Hearing you, Karen. Hang on one second. Oh, sorry. Uh, item 15 is approval of service contract for hearing impairment. 
All right. So we um, also in our district, we have a few students who are hearing impaired. And what we've historically done is contract this person from Nelson County. Well, she retired at the beginning of fall break. Kendra Long is her name. So rather than, Nelson County's not replacing Kendra. Instead, what they have done, they still have to have a, a HI teacher on staff. But what they have done is hired a visually impaired teacher and got what KDE calls a waiver on their visually impaired teacher to also service their hearing impaired kids. So that vision impaired teacher will go and get additional trainings um, to be able to service the hearing impaired kids also. But Kendra reached out to me because she's been the person that we've used from county and said, I would be interested in contracting with you guys so you don't have to go you know, elsewhere, look at a staffing company and so forth. She knows our kids. She's been working with these kids for years. Um, in my opinion, it was the best practice to keep, keep that relationship going. Um, and and it, we also don't have enough kids where we need a full-time person. Um, so we contract with Ms. With Ms. Kendra and she comes on a weekly basis to meet the IEP service needs of those kiddos that have um, hearing impairments. So essentially our contract with Nelson County is ending because she's no longer there and instead of contracting with Nelson County we're just contracting with um, Ms. Long directly. So I'm just asking for approval of that as well please. Okay. Questions? Comments? And I hear approval for service contract for hearing impaired for K. Long. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those are none. Item 16, approval of travel authorization. All right, we'll ask for your approval of a uh, FBLA trip to Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, basically, the reason for your approval is that it is an out-of-state uh, one-day trip. Everything seems to be in order there. Any questions? I'd be glad to ask them. answer those for you. Appropriate chaperones, so forth. Motion to approve travel authorization. Favor second. Second. All those in favor, second by the same guy. Aye. Folks are enough. Item 17, approval leave of absence. We have three of those in your packet today. Uh, all three of these employees uh, are at requesting a medical leave. Um, they have uh, doctor statements that are necessary. Also, Family Medical Leave Act uh, is also completed. Ask for your approval of these three. Do I hear approval for the uh, leave of absences for the, for the three uh, employees? I'm so moved. We are second. Second. All those in favor, stating by the thing out. Aye. Here's a hard one. Item 18. <laughs> Resignations. Disproved. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything else. I guess we don't. We're not going to adjourn today. Well, the good news is uh, uh, we do have uh, two folks that are uh, resigning their position, but in Ms. Rogers' case, which I think you're referring to, she's simply just she's going to continue with and focus on the financial piece here, which we're very blessed to have her uh, there. So hopefully you uh, will be made aware of those items now. So that's all we have in it. I guess it's a good thing don't need your approval for that one. <laughs> well, I don't have That's anything true. else on here, so there's no re no meeting no, determination, so we'll just sit around for a while. And oh. Sorry, on the back. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Site-based meetings are there. Do I hear a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Why don't I have a second page when you do? All those in favor. <laughs> All those in favor. All those in favor, say about the same aye. aye. I'm just questioning your comment that I don't have a second page. <laughs> 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 <laughs>